Bandits attack Nigerian Defense Academy, kill two officers and abduct another from residential area. We hear they are now asking for a ransom. A military veteran is joining us this morning to discuss how this could have happened. The People's Democratic Party gets new chairman in the person of Yemi Akinwumi, the South National Deputy Chairman. The question is, is this the end to the party's leadership crisis? And also coming up is Off the Press, our top trending stories and a look back at events in history. Glad to have you join us on The Breakfast this morning on PLOS TV Africa. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. And I am Aneta Felix saying good morning to you and thanking you for joining us. Otarige, fantastic, good beautiful morning. day today. Both wearing red as, as well. Yes, both wearing red, uh, <laughs> as always. It somehow just always happens, except <laughs> yesterday, though. It was a little different yesterday. Right. All right. So um, our top trending stories this morning, beginning with well, both stories in Lagos. First of all, is that the news we're getting about the COVID-19 situation is very just very sad right and particularly about this one we heard right from the horse's mouth the lagos state governor um governor babajide Sonwulu, who gave a covid 19 update um saying that over a thousand international passengers people who had come into nigeria had absconded from the covid 19 isolation centers um, across the states he says they're coming from red alert states including um uh, he mentioned brazil he mentioned india he said they were also coming from south africa they were coming from turkey these um, countries, we know that they've had some of the highest COVID-19 um, figures globally. So it, basically, they were supposed to um, self-isolate after doing the COVID-19 test and all of that. But he says that they have absconded. So lots of questions really for me. How did they find their way out? You know, lots of people would chip in you know, um, this idea to say, oh, there's a corruption thing in Nigeria where you, it's possible that you go ahead and settle the guards, pay them some amount of money, allow them to, uh, you know, let you go. Others say it's possible that the state of the facilities, uh, you know, just below standard, and these people are coming from, you know, developed countries where they have, ex where, they, where they have been exposed to, you know, high standards of living, and maybe the COVID-19 isolation centers was just somewhere they couldn't stay in. Just different speculation regarding why these people may have fled and what would have you know assisted that uh, abscondment but really the fact is that over a thousand returning passengers and specifically 1073 inbound passengers out of 88,000 who returned to Lagos have fled um, isolation centers in Lagos State. Um, the, he also put out a warning that those who have fled those isolation centers are putting other Nigerians at risk because like I mentioned, you're coming from high-risk states so, or high-risk countries. So even if you never exhibited any symptoms of COVID-19, we know it's asymptomatic. You could be a carrier of the virus. You could be going around um, greeting your family and, family and friends who've come around to say hello to you and to tell you, you know, welcome, you know, and just celebrate your return. But you're putting them at risk um, because you did not properly isolate um, in the country. Well, first of all, when the way it's described, you know, we first start with saying that it's not, the isolation centers are not like heavily guarded, you know, uh, prison yards where you put people in and expect that, you know, if you try to escape, you will be shot. It's not, you know, that kind of uh, situation here. It's not any of the Nigerian correctional uh, facilities uh, look alike. Um, so when they say that they escaped, you know, they probably just, you know, found a way to sneak out and, you know, never, sh um, you know, came back. Um, so th that's one. And then also, it's, I think it's also important to know exactly what the uh, format is or what the um, um, mode of operation is with regards uh, passengers or incoming passengers and, you know, they need, need to isolate. Um, is it still entirely necessary um, that they present a uh, COVID-19 test result from the countries that they are returning from? Because I, understand, I know that a lot of people complain about how expensive it is to travel because of the number of tests that you need to do. Um, bearing in mind that when you do a test here in Nigeria, it costs about 50,000 naira, but, you know, somewhere around that. Um, so those are some of the questions that I feel that need to be asked. You know, did they come in with a COVID-19 test result showing, you know, that they are negative? And after they get into the country, they, I, I believe, are still made to do a test when arriving. 
And so what, do those tests show that they are positive? Are these people who have, been, who have tested positive that the governor is saying have escaped? Or these are people who are simply just made or, you know, the rules just say that they should isolate? Uh, themselves in those isolation centers uh, for uh, 14 days before they are allowed to leave, regardless of whether they test positive or not. Um, th those are the things that are a little confusing because if you've done a test when arriving and you um, are seen to be um, negative, uh, COVID negative, then what are you isolating for? What are you staying in, in that place for 14 days for? Um, but if you have done a test and you have shown to be positive, then obviously you, you definitely should you know, be isolated. Um, and yes, I agree with him. You know, if some, any of these people have tested positive or, you know, are asymptomatic, then they, they are putting, you know, the larger, you know, you know, population at risk because they're going to be moving around Lagos um, without showing any symptoms, but infecting other people. I heard of a, um, a case of uh, someone who died, you know, but he, he unfortunately was the only one who died. Um, all of his family was positive and that was because they had gone for a, a wedding. Um, in that wedding, one person was positive and, you know, basically didn't show any symptoms, spread it, you know, to every other person and eventually lost um, a father. Um, so um, I think it's just important to know if these people have tested after arriving in the country because you are meant to pay for a test and you know, actually carry out a test. Yeah. So did they te test positive and is it these people who have tested positive who have now abs absconded? Or it is simply a protocol that once you get into the country, regardless of whether you've tested positive or not, you must isolate um, and stay there for 14 days. Um, and yes, I would uh, you know, have to uh, agree with, um, no, not necessarily agree, but you understand when people say that, well, those isolation centers aren't necessarily the most comfortable places you know, on earth. Um, and so it's, it's not very, very you know, interesting to tell a person to stay here for 14 days. Does Lagos really even have enough isolation centers to take as many passengers that come in every day and force them to isolate for 14 days? Um, in other countries, I believe that, you know, you may, you know, just be given, you know, after being tested, be asked to, you know, isolate for a couple of days. We may have to change some of all those rules and just tell people uh, to be more careful um, after testing negative um, and all of that. So. Um, if there's some clarity on whether they have tested after arriving, then it might be easier to understand um, mm. the severity of this. Indeed, yes, we, we need all that details, all that clarification regarding if they tested negative or positive. But then Lagos would insist that this is a mandatory isolation. So they didn't really make it any distinction regarding your COVID status. But moving on now, um, something we see quite often in Nigeria is, you know, law enforcement agencies, the police, LASMA, climbing onto people's cars to prevent them from driving off. You know, and then to stop them and, you know, maybe ask any questions they want to ask, check your particulars and all of that. We've seen pictures like that surface on the internet. But one particular one that has um, gone viral now is a video of a last month officer holding onto a truck, you know, just by the passenger's um, door, holding onto that truck. Um, that's the much we know. So if, if maybe we had seen or the, the person recording has started from when this whole incident occurred, we might have more clarity regarding what's going on there. But what we know definitely, or what we can infer, is that it's possible that the man had tried to, you know, maybe ask questions, maybe, you know, just maybe ask questions, and um, that man wasn't having it. The last time our official climbs onto the truck and the guy just speeds off. And what we see there is him holding on for dear life, hanging on to that truck. And uh, the truck just keeps moving and it slows down at a particular point. You can see him step on the brakes um, there. And then in the next few seconds, we see the last more official just fall to the ground, um, just landing with his back. And I can imagine how hurtful that would be. But really, like I mentioned, it's something we've seen um, a lot in the country, something we've, we've seen lots of pictures, videos of police officers hanging onto cars. So lots of questions that I have. First of all, is this even legal? Is this legal for a LASMA official to go ahead and do this? Is this legal for a LASMA official to do that? Is it's this a, part of your job description? Because when I read through the um, duties and responsibilities of the last more official. I see that they are basically there to ensure you no know, smooth flow of traffic. They are not even there to check your particulars. The last more official, it's, it's beyond the authority, it's beyond your jurisdiction to go ahead and check your, your, your particulars, ask you for your permit. That's not their job. But it's also, I think it's, it's also important that we know what, you know, started this. Exactly you know, what I said. What exactly we, we do not know what built yeah. up to that. But what I'm saying is, is it even worth 
him risking his life all the way. I mean, something could have happened. That could have been worse. He could have lost his life. Something drastic could have happened. So was whatever, you know, that spurred that action worth it for you to risk your life so? So I think, it's, you know, it's um, both parties are wrong, the last one official and um, the driver of that truck. Um, but, you know, these, all these things, you know, really just show that we're still having very, very crude means of enforcing traffic laws in Nigeria. Um, um, you would expect that in 2021, there are certain things that shouldn't, you know, be necessary anymore. You simply would get the person's, um, you know, plate, plate number. number, you know, and track them or find them where, wherever they are or send their fines to them. And, you know, they know that they're owing the state um, so, so and so amount for breaking a traffic law, whatever that law was. But we still don't have any of those things going on. And that's why you see people, you know, a last official jumping on a vehicle. And it's also because a lot of times people have seen that last officials um, you know, will f somehow, some way. Uh, so even when I was going home a couple of days ago, I saw someone beat the traffic light. Um, last month, you know, blocked the Admiralty gate, um, the gate into Le Lecky Phase 1. Or they, they immediately sprung up and the guy stopped and started to, you know, reverse back into traffic, which was also very, very dangerous um, and unlawful also. But, you know, it's Nigeria and these are some of the things that um, Nigerians will do because, well, they, you know, there's not enough of these laws to checkmate some of these things. We simply should do better with regards to our traffic laws and the ways that we apprehend or, you know, find people um, so that, you know, they stop putting their lives at risk, uh, you know, like this. I don't think it's worth it. If he had died, um, you know, or he had injured himself or had, you know, um, suffered um, internal injuries from that fall, he, he obviously, as a lot of people, doesn't have enough money to go through, you know, um, the full medical treatment or therapy that he will need. And so it's really not um, worth it. But it once again shows that we still have very, very, very backward ways of enforcing traffic, you know, laws and regulations across Nigeria. And that also includes the FRSC. So true. It doesn't need to get to this level. You simply need, all you need to do is get the, uh, the, uh, traffic, uh, the plate number of the, of the vehicle and find them. But there is no pro proper documentation for some of all these things. A lot of these vehicles aren't registered. Um, and people also feel very, you know, a lot of times vindicate, uh, vindicated by or, you know, aggrieved by these uh, last month officials, um, including, you know, the, what are the other ones that wear white and black called, I um, um, can't remember their names now. Um, there, there's a lot of those people that Nigerians and Lagosians feel very, very, you know, um, um, upset with um, because of how sometimes very bitter they are. Um, if you have committed a traffic um, offence, you should pay a fine, 10000 15000 20000 A couple of months ago, the Lagos State Government put out new laws that people need to adhere to and, you know, the fines that were, you know, attached to them. Um, but we need to find better ways of finding people who have committed these offences, breaking traffic laws, over-speeding, whatever it is. And, you know, and, and that's it. Um, so I, I think one of the first things is how many Nigerians actually went to driving school? How many Nigerians actually know these traffic laws? Because we know how people learn how to drive in Nigeria. It's informal. Your friend teaches you, your dad teaches you, your uncle teaches you. If, you're not, if you don't go through the proper way... See, I have friends who share their experiences with me about how they get their driver's license abroad. It's a rigorous process. Yes. You go through rigorous checks. You have to know the laws. You have to know the signs. You have to know how to obey them. You have to know how to respond to them. So it doesn't happen like that in Nigeria. You have people who can arrange your driver's license in 24 hours just for you to have the money to pay. So you don't even need to know how to drive. You don't need to know how, you don't need to have an understanding of the traffic laws. It just, everything just happens as, as, as you have the money for it, you yeah. know? So that's the first thing. People need to have a reorientation regarding traffic laws because people could be breaking a traffic law unintentionally and unknowingly, but ignorance is really no excuse anyway. That's why I say the first thing is for people to be able to understand that you need to learn these traffic laws, go to a proper driving school and learn how to drive because that's how people put others at risk and others in danger, road accidents and things like that. Absolutely. So that's the first thing. Second of all, when these traffic laws are... When, like, for example, the new ones you talked about, how many people know about them? How much publicity do they get, how, you know, to put them in the faces of the people who should be obeying them? So, also, you have the situation where a traffic official would wait for you to fall into the trap. Yeah. Rather than correct you and say, no, this is a one-way street, you can't go that way. They would not correct you. They would not do the duty. They wait for you to fall into that trap. And then they send their colleagues to block you in front there's, and there's they extort you. So there's the issue of extortion. So because of that issue of extortion, that's why you have situations where you see that these traffic 
of um, enforcers, they do not do their job because they want you to break the law so they can extort you of money. So there's, a, there's a couple of places, uh, you know, on the island here that are one way or have suddenly, you know, become one way um, um, uh, streets or mm -hmm. roads that there's no sign showing. You know, but there's people who are, you know, patiently waiting, you know, in, the, in every corner, waiting for you to get on that road so that they can, of course, extort you. Like you said, um, yes, I understand that ignorance is no excuse, but there's many places. There's one of them that I know that's just after Oniru that there is no sign to say that this is a, actually a one way street. But um, they don't tell you that. So they wait for you patiently, set, you know, that trap and wait for a car to drive in, and then they, of course, you know, block your vehicle and ask that you pay 50,000 naira or something. Eventually, you negotiate and maybe pay 10,000 naira or 15,000 naira, and that's it. Um, but once again, the processes through which we enforce traffic laws need to be changed or need to be, you know, to be worked on. Um, we cannot continue to live in this very, very backward um, um, uh, times where, you know, you need to jump on a person's vehicle to enforce, you know, to ask them to stop. It it's, doesn't make any sense. Um, there's also not enough of these... Um, um, uh, vehicles to even chase a traffic offender if necessary. But even if you don't need to chase, get his plate number, you know his address, you know where he's registered, you know everything about every single vehicle. The so-called cameras that are meant to even capture those things, don't, they don't even work. So that's why we see these things. Hmm, sad. I just hope that that last more official is safe All right. um, sound. I think we should also chip in on the NDA incident. It's going to be one of our major topics um, mm -hmm. um, uh, later, uh, this morning on the show. And, but it was, a, it was a really, really sad um, incident yesterday, seeing reports of uh, bandits attacking, what they're called bandits, attacking the Nigerian Defense Academy in um, Kaduna mm -hmm. State. And you know, hearing that two um, officers lost their lives. Reports that I've seen in the last few hours show that even the person that was kidnapped, this is not 100% verified, but it says that the person that was kidnapped um, that they're asking for 200 million naira ransom for may have also died. Um, it's um, very, 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 very sad. Um, and I think one of the parts that is even more shocking, or I think is insulting, um, and it, it's a slap on the face, and it, you're almost spitting in the face of those who lost their lives yesterday by putting out a statement saying that the CCTV uh, camera, or the guy who was meant to be watching the CCTV, yes. slept off. That, I don't, so I've seen people say they don't know which is worse, if it's the attack or, is, or it's that report or that you know, story uh, put out by the army uh, to say that somebody slept off and that's why it happened. Um, I don't know in any world. So, so there's so much that I wish that, was, that we would able to be able to say about this, but it's really just still pain and frustration seeing where we are currently with regards security, that bandits are now even bold enough. It's not the first time it's happened to attack army formations, to attack you know, the Nigerian Defense Academy. They are bold enough on that level. So it's not just students now. It's not you know, people in universities, not you know, uh, primary school um, pupils who are being you know, kidnapped or being attacked. Even the Nigerian army itself is being attacked in broad daylight. It's really, really, really sad. Um, and so CCTV, you should never put out a statement like that in the first place. That's not the answer to security. If you put CCTV in every school, it's not going to stop anybody from attacking. It really just shows the incapabilities of the Nigerian army on that level and also tells you that there is no actual or no good enough um, intelligence with regards to the Nigerian army to know when they're going to be attacked. It's not CCTV that is the problem here. It is the fact that we now have bandits bold enough to attack the Nigerian army. So nobody is safe. Nobody so, whatsoever so, is so safe. So this, this is one of the most daring news I've heard, one of the most outrageous news I've heard in recent time. I've heard of students being kidnapped. It's sort of become like a norm here, sadly. But this one, about the terrorists taking it to the security officials, the Nigerian Defense Academy, it's, it's, it's as daring as it can get. But I want to say I'm exactly surprised because last week we shared a news or so on the Daily Trust newspapers that bandits, this is something I, I discussed with Mr. Aguli, I said bandits are talking to other bandits, telling them to begin to attack government officials, um, military men, and attack government uh, installations, attack military um, infrastructure, and that they should leave the kids alone. I asked Mr. Aguli that question, and he says maybe if this happened, possibly they would sit up. We never knew that just in a few days' time they would actually follow through on their word, and that's what we've seen today. Well, I don't wish for so anyone to, have, uh, to you know, be attacked. I don't want wish for anybody, you know, regardless of who they are, to be attacked by bandits or to you know suffer uh, from you know the security situation we're, we're dealing with in the country. 
um, but it still really just paints, you know, the very, 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 very clear picture of the truth with regards to what we, where we are with security. And the Minister of Information or somebody or other person is going to come out tomorrow and say, oh, you know, we've done, you know, exceptionally well with regards to security. But these things, you know, t paint a totally different picture. I saw someone, you know, commenting yesterday saying that when, um, you know, uh, the Nigerian soldiers are attacked or killed in different parts of the country, you immediately see the army flooding that community with soldiers and anybody who they find in that time will suffer, you know, dearly. You remember it happened in Benue State not long ago. It's happened in a um, former president Oshigo Basanjo's time in um, um, that community that lost, uh, that's Timaya sang about, um, OD. Yeah, it happened in, in, in a couple of other places. Um, and the person was saying, why don't we have the Nigerian army do the same thing to these bandits? Why aren't we having the same reaction when a soldier is killed? These same people have shot down military aircraft, you know, twice this year already. These same people have attacked schools. These same people have kidnapped hundreds, maybe even thousands of Nigerians. These same people are um, getting amnesty from the same people Absolutely. These same people are getting... Attacking. So these same people now who have attacked the NDA, it will be sickening in a few weeks to hear that oh you know there's there's amnesty they or they're them. being forgiven or they're surrendering and some of all of that it was unintentional it's, so it, it just it just really really is heartbreaking um someone also did um you know a, um a google is a google map now the you know yeah google map um uh, illustration of you know the distance between the nigerian defense academy and um the uh, nigerian air force base in kaduna it's a 16 minute drive so you mean to say that during this attack, there was no response, there was no, you know, nobody, you know, that was able to send any, you know, uh, distress You're talking about that. That NDA is actually close to distances. the Federal College of First Room Mechanization, AFACA, that, you know, bandits also invaded and, and, and kidnapped students. So the NDA could not respond, as far as we know. So now we're now saying, oh, the NDA could not save the children. Now the Air Force could not help the military. So if they attack the Air Force, who would we blame for not helping the Air Force? So it's just, it's, it, it's a mess, to be honest. But uh, I guess we can take a break here and see what uh, the papers are saying. We'll be right back.